Hello and welcome everyone to the Oceanside Library. Uh, thank you for attending our lecture, The Six Strangest Presidential Elections So Far. I'd like to introduce our presenter for today, Martin Levinson. Take it away, Martin. Well, thank you. And uh, thank you all for coming today. It's a beautiful day. You could have been strolling the streets of Oceanside or wherever you're from, imagine Oceanside, but you're here, which is great. So I guess maybe the title of the lecture intrigued you, The Six Strangest Presidential Elections so far. And of course, I think everyone gets the idea that so far is the coming election. So if I did this uh, talk maybe after first Tuesday in November, I might include it, but I will see. Okay, so anyway, my background, I uh, have a PhD. I uh, do a lot of lectures out here in Suffolk County. I live in Suffolk County, big interest in history. I've written a lot of articles and books on history. So there you have it. Okay. So uh, the six strangest presidential elections so far, I'm not gonna do the 2016 election. Some people think that was a strange election and it was, but it was really only strange in the fact that nobody predicted Trump would win except my friend who was a professor at Fordham. He said Trump will win. I said, really, why do you think that is? He said, well, have you read the book Amusing Ourselves to Death? I said, no. He said, yeah, that book by Neil Postman talks about the fact that in the age of television, politics is all about showbiz and Trump is by far more entertaining than Hillary. So I bet my department chairman $100 that Trump's gonna win the election. And he collected, and don't you know, he's the only person I know who predicted Trump winning. Okay, so the six strangest presidential elections so far, the first one is the presidential election of 1800. That's an election of Adams versus Jefferson. But before I do that, I wanna tell you that George Washington, who's was our first president, as you know, was elected by acclamation when he ran for president. The only president who's always who got all the votes in the Electoral College. There were no political parties at the time and everyone knew he was going to win. None of the founders had predicted political parties, but laughably, they were the ones who formed the parties. Before Washington left office, he spoke about the dangers of having political parties. So don't do it. Then there were the parties. The first party basically was the Democratic hyphen Republican Party. Don't get that confused with either the Democrats or the Republicans of today, but it's called Democratic hyphen Republican Party. And then there was the Federalist Party. Those were the two big parties. So uh, Thomas Jefferson ran on the Democratic Republican Party and his opponent Adams ran on the uh, Federalist Party. And of course, uh, there was the Electoral College back then, which is sort of an anachronism. It was put into place uh, in the constitution because uh, basically the founders didn't trust the people. Uh, they felt, you know, you can't let the rabble, and by the way, when the rabble, uh, in the early elections, the electorate consisted of white men owning property. And so the first number of elections, that was 6% of the country. So 6% of the country was, were voting for, you know, presidents, you know, other white men who didn't own property couldn't vote, of course, women couldn't vote, uh, and blacks, you know, couldn't vote. So it was very small electorate, which expanded down the line, more whites could vote. And eventually, you know, with the Civil War, blacks received the vote. And even women received the vote, you know, in 1920. This year, by the way, is the 100th anniversary of the amendment where women received the vote. So there you go. Okay, so this is the election. You have Adams versus Jefferson. And uh, it was pretty good, you know, pretty, pretty rough election, as, as many are. Uh, it was sort of a partial replay of the campaigns of 1796 with the Jeffersonians opposing the Federalist policies. You know, Jefferson wanted a small government, state government, and Adams was more for federal government. Uh, Adams was really uh, with, uh, with Hamilton. You know, Hamilton was a, was a Federalist and wanted more of a national government. And uh, so there you have it, so Adams versus Jefferson. And uh, so the election is on and there was all kinds of mudslinging. Uh, one person called Adams a hideous hermaphroditic, he had a hideous hermaphroditical character, whatever that means. And a Federalist named Burley claimed that if Jefferson won, murder, robbery, rape, adultery, and incest will be openly taught and practiced. So you think today <laughs> the politics are rough with the mudslinging? It was worse back then. I'm going to go into some other areas where it was worse. Okay. So anyway, so they do the election and guess what? Each candidate gets 73 electoral votes. Oh, that's not good. So uh, now you have a tie and uh, it's a problem. So the tie sent the election to the lame duck House of Representatives 
where federal is dominated. Though public opinion favored Jefferson, many federalists decided to throw their support to Aaron Burr, who was also on the ticket, hoping to keep Jefferson from the nation's highest office. Now, Aaron Burr refused to confirm that he would turn down the presidency if the House voted in his favor leading some people to conclude that he was secretly angling for the job. Now, Alexander Hamilton was one of those people. Uh, by the way, you know what happened to poor Hamilton and Burr, you know, Burr killed him in a duel. Uh, though, we dis though we disagree with Jefferson, this is Hamilton, on nearly every political issue, he thought Burr had few principles beyond his own ambition. In a fierce letter writing campaign that would continue from mid-December through January, Hamilton worked hard to convince his Federalists of this fact. And he basically uh, wrote against, uh, you know, he, he basically was trying to support um, Adams. Uh, but Hamilton had lost much of his, I'm sorry, Jefferson, but Hamilton had lost much of his influence among fellow Federalists due to his vicious attacks on Adams, as well as the scandal in his personal life. Yeah, Hamilton had an interesting scandal in his personal life. Um, maybe if you saw the uh, show, the Broadway show, you know about it. But uh, he was having an affair. And uh, basically, a couple of guys tried to blackmail him. And he said, uh, nah, you're not gonna blackmail me. I'll just publish the fact that I'm having the affair, which wasn't good for the marriage. Uh, but basically, um, he got it out into the open. Okay, so, but Hamilton, as I said, most, most of his influence. So by the time the House began voting now in 1801, Hamilton's concerns about Burr had failed to sway many members of his party. Now the Constitution mandated that each state's delegation in the House vote as a single plot to decide, to decide the election, which by the way is true even today. What happens today is if there's a, some sort of a problem, uh, state, the states will vote for a president and each state gets one vote. And it's the legislatures that decide uh, what the vote's gonna be. So if, that, if this election is, if that goes in the 2020 election, Let's hope that doesn't happen, because that'll be terrible. This put a great deal of power in the hands of one man. So when they decided to be a House vote, it was this fellow by the name of James Bayard, who was the lone representative of his state in 1800. So if he changed his vote, his state changed his vote. And in the final ballot that followed, and there were 34 ballots in the voting, and Bayard cast Delaware's vote for Aaron Burr. You know, Burr wasn't gonna win, but he just kept voting for Burr. But finally, uh, Jefferson and his friends convinced him to vote for Jefferson. And so on the 36th round of voting in the House, Delaware, uh, Bayer submitted a blank ballot. So he wasn't voting for Burr. And Federalists also stepped aside in Vermont and Maryland, allowing those state delegations to vote for Jefferson, sealing his victory. So it was a crazy election. It went into the House. You had 36 ballots. And finally, Jefferson wins. So, you know, as strange as this 2020 elections may be, that was a pretty strange election. Uh, Jefferson later wrote that his victory in 1800 was as real a revolution in the principles of our government as that of 1776 was in its form. Federalists would never win another presidential race. And by 1815, they ceased to exist as a party. With Republicans firmly in control of the government, that's Democrat Republicans, the 12th Amendment was passed by the end of Jefferson's first term, amending the electoral process that separated the process of electing president and vice president, uh, and separating the process of electing president and vice president. Before that, you didn't have a separation. You voted and number one was president, number two was vice president. Pretty terrible system. Okay, so this is the electoral map of 1820. You can see uh, not many states voting, and again, only white men with property. There's Burr and Hamilton, sadly the duel. And now we come to another strange election, the election of 1824. And Martin, um, if I can yes. interrupt for a second, there was one comment from Howard. He said, ironically, Jefferson acted like a Federalist when he made the Louisiana Purchase. Oh, that's a very good comment, yeah. that's right. Jefferson actually, <laughs> he did act like a Federalist when he made it, and uh, thank God he did, because he really expanded our nation. But that's right. Uh, as principled as you are, you know, for one particular party, if you see something that can benefit you or your nation, you may ditch it. Great comment. Thank you. 
Election of 1824. So the election of 1824 was strange from the get-go, uh, if only for the fact that the Federalist Party was on the cusp of extinction and all four candidates were from the same party, the Democratic Republican Party. Each of those nominated, Henry Clay, William Crawford, John Quincy Adams, and Andrew Jackson, represented a different geographic part of the country. As had become common in presidential campaigns, the newspapers at the time were very favorable to those they supported. Okay. And they also, you know, attacked those they didn't support. Now, <laughs> how about this for an attack? Uh, so they, they made, uh, they talked about a, a poorly Adams dressed, and it's, of course, English wife. They called Clay a drunkard and gambler. They charged that Crawford had done unlawful acts in office and accused Jackson of murder. <laughs> By the way, Andrew Jackson was a war hero, you know, War of 1812, won a big victory. That battle should never have been fought because the war was over by then, but they didn't have the internet so, or a telephone, so they didn't know the war was over. Anyway, Jackson was a war hero and statesman. He won the popular vote by fewer than 39,000 ballots and took 99 electoral college votes. Secretary of State John Quincy Adams got 84 votes. Treasury Secretary William Crawford won 41, and House Speaker Henry Clay, 37. So with no candidate earning a majority of the votes, the House again had to settle the deadlock. Jackson was confident he would win the presidency given that he had won the popular vote and the Electoral College. Because the House could choose among only three candidates, Clay got the boot. He was the fourth vote getter. So each state had one vote and only the top three vote recipients participated. Clay could not compete, he came in fourth. But Clay believed that Adams was the best qualified to be president. He didn't think that Jackson's success as a general meant he was ready for the presidency. So he supported Adams. And that was the, the big difference because he supported Adams. Uh, Adams won that election of 1824. And uh, when he was in office, he made Clay his secretary of state. And then people accused Adams and Clay of what is known as a corrupt bargain. In other words, the idea was, okay, Clay said, here's the votes for you, Adams. Now you make me Secretary of State. Now that was, that's never been proven, but on the face of it, it doesn't look good. So Jackson vacated his Senate seat and decided in 1828, he was going to run again as a Washington outsider. You know, it's great. Always good to run as an outsider. Adams was a senator, but he said, eh, I'll run as an outsider. And in 1828, he did win the election against John Quincy Adams, who, by the way, um, wasn't that great a president, but was a wonderful Secretary of State. You know, the Monroe Doctrine was really John Quincy Adams wrote it. So he won the election of 1828. Now, that's not one of the craziest, the strangest elections in here, but that was a sad election because uh, there was a lot of mudslinging. And uh, in that election, Jackson's wife, Rachel, was called a convicted adulteress because she had years earlier married Jackson before finalizing her divorce to her previous husband. So I think that was kind of a bureaucratic, you know, I don't think they did it intentionally. You know, the records weren't all so good back then. I think she really thought she was divorced, but her, the opponents used it and called, uh, you know, said they were living in sin. Is she not really your wife? You married to someone else. And uh, when Jackson became president, she had a heart attack and died. And he blamed his opponents for doing that. And uh, he said, you know, uh, may God Almighty forgive her murderers, he said, as I know she forgave them, but I know I don't. So he was pretty angry, understandably. Anyway, that was just a sad, sad election. Okay, so now we'll get to the next. Let me just show you some pictures. That's 1824. Look, more states are voting. Yay. And there's Rachel Jackson, the scandalous divorcee. And uh, we'll now get to the next election. This is a really strange election and a very important election. Uh, the election of 1876. So, so these are the two candidates. There's Rutherford, I don't have, this is initial as B, Rutherford B. Hayes. And he's running against uh, Governor Samuel Tilden. Hayes is the Republican. And don't forget back then the Republicans were like the liberal party, right? Lincoln was the first Republican. Uh, so, and the Republicans were the ones that were, you know, the, the North in the Civil War, they were the ones, and the Democrats were the South. 
So, you know, the Democrats were the conservative South. Uh, and actually, it stayed that way till the 1960s. Once Lyndon Johnson signed the Civil Rights Bill, it flipped from Democrat to Republican because so many Southerners uh, were, were for segregation, so they decided to split parties once Johnson signed it. Okay. So in 1876, we have these two major candidates. They're both boring uh, and dull. They could never run today because today, if you don't have at least an interesting presentation and look fairly presentable, you're doomed because we live in a TV culture. But back then, it didn't matter. Uh, you know, you only saw the pictures of presidents in newspapers. You hardly ever, you probably never saw the president in person. Okay. So they were, you know, fairly prestigious guys. They, you know, had good educations, et cetera. And so in the election, Tilden received a quarter million more votes than Hayes. And he won 19 more votes in the Electoral College. The problem was, Tilden in the Electoral College was one vote away from a majority of 185 votes. And four states composing a total of 20 votes, Florida, Louisiana, South Carolina, and Oregon, were disputing the results. The Republicans charged the Democrats had intimidated black voters in the states of Florida, Louisiana, and South Carolina. And then Oregon, one of Hayes' electors, was ruled ineligible because he was a federal office holder. And the Democratic uh, governor appointed someone from his own party in the man's place. So this was an unprecedented constitutional crisis. They're arguing over the legitimacy of electoral college votes. So the Congress of the U.S. then proposed a law that formed a 15-member electoral commission to settle the result. Five members were to be selected from each House of Congress, and they would be joined by five members of the Supreme Court. That would yield seven Democrats, seven Republicans, and one Independent. And the Independent was a Supreme Court justice by the name of David Davis, who is said, was said by one historian that perhaps not even Davis knew which presidential candidate he preferred. So he was a genuine Independent. But just as the Electoral Commission Bill was passing Congress, the legislature of Illinois elected Davis to the Senate. Democrats in the Illinois legislature believed that they had purchased Davis's support by voting for him, but they made a mistake. Instead of staying on the Supreme Court so that he could serve on the commission, he resigned from the court to take his Senate seat. So he gave up his seat on the commission. So the Democrats really blew it. All the remaining justices who could become to take Davis's place were Republicans. So basically, they gave the election to Rutherford B. Hayes, which was, you know, quite the thing. So anyway, there were intense closed-door meetings because the Republicans, even if they won, they didn't want you know, riots in the country. And they wanted to get the Democrats on board with the election. So they made a deal. Democrats, the leaders, agreed reluctantly to accept Hayes as president, but they said in return for us accepting you as president, we want the federal government to withdraw troops from the last still occupied southern states, South Carolina and Louisiana. Now these troops were in there because of reconstruction. Now after the Civil War, troops, uh, federal troops were in the South to make sure that the blacks would have their rights. And it worked out pretty well. In Mississippi, uh, during Reconstruction, 96% of blacks voted. Once the troops were out and the state up to the states by 1900, 6% of blacks in Mississippi were voting. I mean, if you were black in the South after the Civil War and after Reconstruction, not good. You know, they prevented you from voting. They did poll taxes and you know, reading tests and all kinds of stuff. Uh, and plus lynchings, and it was just not great. But that was the deal. It was the end of Reconstruction. So that why, that's one of the re reasons why this is such an important election, because Reconstruction then ended under Hayes' presidency. So the 1876 election is the second of five presidential elections uh, in which, where am I? Okay, in which the person who won the most popular votes did not win the election. But the only election in which the popular vote winner received a majority rather than a plurality of the popular vote. And then in one of my lectures, someone asked, what's the difference between a majority and a plurality? Well, a majority is at least one over 50. 
And the plurality, you know, if there's three people running, you could win 40, the other guy 30, or whatever it is. So you can have less than 50% and win in a plurality. But a majority, you're over 50. So today, that this election is the, um, had the smallest electoral vote victory, 185 to 184. That was the margin. And the election that yielded the highest voter turnout. So, you know, what do we get? 45, 50% voting, maybe. In that election, 81.8% of the people voted. Huge turnout. Okay, and there you see the electoral maps expanding. You know, we're getting to be a bigger country. That's the end of Reconstruction. They made the deal so Hayes would be president. And that's the end of Black rights in the South. Okay, the election of 1888, I was there. So, uh, so that was the third of five US presidential elections and the second within 12 years, in which the winner did not receive a plurality of the national vote. Benjamin Harrison, who won the election, lost the popular vote by 100,000 votes. That's the Electoral College. You know, you can lose a popular vote, as you know, Trump did in 2016, but he can win the election. So Grover Cleveland now is running against Benjamin Harrison. Grover Cleveland's a Democrat. Harrison's a Republican. Cleveland, um, two interesting candidates. Harrison actually was a... Um, was war veterans loved Harrison. He, Harrison served in the Union Army during the Civil War with distinction. He saw action. He retired with the rank of Brigadier General. Grover Cleveland bought his way out of the Civil War. Back then, if you didn't want to fight, you could pay $300 and find a substitute to take your place. And that's what Cleveland did. So that didn't, um, war veterans were not enamored with the fact that he you know, got out of serving by buying a substitute. Uh, but, uh, and also in terms of um, the campaigning, Harrison was really a, um, he was a good speaker, but he had a very bad personality, cold. His nickname was the human iceberg. So uh, <laughs> that's, but he still won the election, right? So they did, uh, I won't go into the particular, uh, the particular issues back then, but in any event, what was interesting in this election, I'll tell you about something called the Murchison letter. Uh, which worked, you know, we talked about then the Russians may have influenced what happened in the 2016 election. Well, the British, I think, influenced what happened in the 1888 election. So here's what happened with the Murchison letter. A California Republican named George Osgoodby wrote a letter to Sir Sackville West, the British ambassador to the U.S., under the assumed name of Charles F. Murchison describing himself as a former Englishman who was now a California citizen and asked how we should vote in the upcoming presidential election. So Lionel wrote back and in the Murchison letter indiscreetly suggested that Cleveland was probably the best man from the British point of view. The Republicans published this letter just two weeks before the election where it had an effect on Irish American voters exactly comparable to the rum, Romanism, and rebellion blunder of the previous election. Now, in that election, 1884, uh, they used that slogan <laughs> against the person who the slogan was, uh, was, was coined for. Romanism meant you were a Catholic, and basically, if you would win, then the Pope would run the country. So rum, Romanism, and rebellion was something that was not good. It was a derogatory term against the Catholics and it alienated a lot of Irish American voters. And there were a lot of those voters in the country. And certainly uh, that letter, which when the British said, I support whatever, and the Irish were big fans of the British, it turned them against the candidate. In any event, Benjamin Harrison won the election. And when he took office, many considered that he did not deserve the position. You know, he won less than the popular vote and looked upon him as a Republican Party stooge. But to his credit, he disappointed the Republican Party by nominating people to his cabinet based on their qualifications. How about that? Not that you're just a friend or a buddy, or you know, you're a political favor for someone, but yeah, you know, they actually gave it to him based on his qualifications. Okay, and um, so Harrison did not have his mind on the election uh, in the next election because his wife was dying 
And she did what, die in two weeks before the 1892 election because she ran again. Now, Cleveland was the incumbent in this election of 1888. He had won the previous election. So he lost you know, the election. But Cleveland ran again in 1892. So for argument's sake, let's say Trump loses this year. Well, he could run again in 2024. And if he wins, he'd be like Cleveland. Now, Cleveland's an interesting president because he's sort of an older guy, but then he married a woman 24 years younger than he was, and they had a bunch of children. And um, actually, that was interesting because uh, the country liked that, that they loved his wife, Frances. She was one of the most loved, beloved first ladies. And uh, when Cleveland lost the election in 1888, Francis turned to the people in the White House who were responsible for you know, keeping the building up and said, don't move the furniture, we'll be back. And you know what? They were back, she was right. So that was the election of 1888. Um, Harrison um, lost the 1892 election in a landslide, by the way. Uh, he only got 145 electoral votes to Cleveland's 277. And he ran back to, uh, and he went back to his legal career. But uh, the election of 1888, certainly um, there's a strange election because of the Murchison letter and uh, also, also because uh, there was all kinds of corruption back within that election. Uh, Benjamin Harrison, uh, well, I won't, I won't get, I want to do some more elections, but there were, there were, there were people where, um, I'm not going to do more on that election because I want to get into the other two elections. I want to take your questions. But in all the elections I'm talking about, I think what you want to do after this lecture, since you know it's a library sponsoring the lecture, you can get books out on these elections or on the presidents who were, and the candidates who were part of the elections. They're fascinating. I mean, I can only skim the surface of this stuff. But um, the more you read, it's, it's human interest. And also it gives you perspective. I mean, we think, you know, today, oh, it's terrible, politics is so corrupt, and the people, the elections party is so dirty, the campaigning. It was corrupt a lot of the time before this, and as far as dirty politics, wow, 19th century, and in the 20th, we're going to talk a little bit about that. Okay, so this is 1888. There's the electoral map. It's really expanding. Uh, that's the Murchison letter. That's a fascinating letter, right? The idea that, um, and it was sort of a plan to use that letter against the candidate. And it was a phony letter, but they really dirty tricks, which, you know, Nixon's famous for dirty tricks, right? Uh, that's his known as Tricky Dick Nixon, which was a nickname given to him by, uh, I think, uh, Helen Gahagan Douglas, who ran against him for uh, president, not president, for Senate in 52. Okay, so. Uh, is now now we come to this truly is a strange election the election of 1912 in this election you have four candidates woodrow wilson theodore roosevelt william taft and eugene debs now debs to me is interesting he's debs is, runs as a socialist he ran four times for president uh, the last time he ran he ran from prison because he was arrested for being seditious during the World War I. Uh, there was something called the Alien and Sedition Acts passed in World War I, where you really couldn't talk against the government. This is this was, this was a horrible act, really unconstitutional. Uh, and they, but you know, they couldn't do anything, people couldn't do anything about it. So uh, they threw Debs in jail. And he said, uh, <laughs> when he was campaigning, he said, you know, if I win this election, I'm gonna pardon myself. So he's not the first person to think of that. Okay, so there's Woodrow Wilson running against Roosevelt and Taft. Now, how come so many candidates? Well, you can understand Eugene V. Debs because he's a socialist, he's always running. He's a professional candidate runner. But, um, uh, you know, why Roosevelt and Taft? That seems odd, and it was odd. And the reason it was odd was because, um, well, Roosevelt uh, became president when uh, he was vice president. He was the vice president of William McKinley. Uh, McKinley was assassinated and Roosevelt became president. And, you know, no one 
thought he'd ever become president. Actually, he was made vice president because he was such a pain in the neck with the Republican leaders. They said, let's get Roosevelt at the vice president's job. We'll never hear from him again. And so, and of course, the vice presidency, you know, before kind of the modern era, was a do-nothing job. You basically showed up. You, you know, could do anything you want during the day. The president didn't care about you. Nobody cared about you. But he became president, and he was a great president. I mean, in presidential rankings, he's way up there, They're always in the top 10, more than the top five. Um, just a really mover and a shake of Panama Canal, fleet, won a Nobel Peace Prize. This is a real mover and shaker. And uh, so, but when he became president, he said, you know, I'll run again once, and I won't run again after that. And he could have. There was no law against how many times you could run back then. You know, the reason there were only two terms for most of the presidents before FDR was because of tradition. You know, when Washington was president, he could have been president for life because he was so popular. Anytime he wanted to run, he would have won. But after two terms, he stepped down. And that was considered a big deal, giving up power like that. And so uh, it became a tradition in the country not to run more, run more than two terms. And Teddy Roosevelt really regretted that because he was so popular, he could have won, but he, okay. So he picked as his successor, this fellow William Taft, you can see the picture there, very heavy guy, over 300 pounds. There's a story that uh, he was taking a bath in the White House bathtub and he couldn't get out and four guys had to help him out of the tub. I'm not sure that story is true, but historians tell it. But um, and I think Taft could never run today because uh, he would look bad on TV. So anyway, uh, Teddy Roosevelt, uh, Taft was the vice president, and Teddy Roosevelt said to Taft, you become, you become president, I'll support you. And he, he did, and from 1908 to 1912, Taft was president, and Roosevelt just didn't like the job Taft was doing. He felt he wasn't progressive enough, he wasn't following Roosevelt's policy, even though Taft was a fairly good president, and actually was doing a lot of what Roosevelt wanted to be done. But Roosevelt wasn't happy. And also, I think Roosevelt was bored. And so he decided, you know what? I'll run against Taft. And he ran in the primary. And Roosevelt was much more popular than Taft. And had the Republicans selected Roosevelt as their candidate in 1912, he would have easily beat Wilson and been president. But the Republicans uh, selected Taft. The leaders decided to go with Taft because I guess they owed him stuff. And I guess because they felt he deserved it. He was the former president. He deserved it, even though it was a bad move. And Taft was the nominee of the Republican Party. And Theodore Roosevelt said, really? Okay, so I'll form my own party and run against Wilson. Well, that basically was a great deal for Wilson. It guaranteed Wilson would be president because what it did, it split the Republican vote. And um, Wilson, who would definitely, who was a governor of New Jersey, a Princeton professor, would have never been president, became president. And by the way, in the rankings, Wilson's going down in the presidential rankings. Uh, Wilson was a racist, uh, but everyone knew that. He was still up there in presidential rankings. But the last couple of years, race has become more important issue in America. So people are taking more of a look at Wilson. And now he's sort of going down in presidential rankings. His name's being taken off places. Uh, you know, college houses or college, you know, buildings that are named after Wilson, they're taking that away. Dining rooms, I know the Princeton Club in New York uh, used to be the Woodrow Wilson Dining Room. That's gone. Another name. So he's definitely, and he, Wilson, he, the first movie, Birth of a Nation, uh, he showed it in the White House. It's about the Ku Klux Klan. He praised the movie. Wilson actually uh, segregated the federal government. Uh, he just, you know, he was a... Uh, but he was born in Virginia, not to excuse him, but you know, that was his background. Okay, so you have Roosevelt and Taft against Wilson. And uh, Taft knew once Roosevelt was in the race, Taft was doomed. So Taft hardly campaigned, and which was fine with Taft because Taft never wanted to be president. The only reason he took the job was because his wife wanted to be first lady. Taft really wanted to be a Supreme Court judge. And uh, luckily, he lost the election, but in the 1920s, he was appointed to the court, and he was much happier as a Supreme Court judge than as a president, which to him was a burden and a job he didn't think he was suited for. Okay, so now Teddy Roosevelt's running in the election, um, and he's running in the Progressive Party, 
and during the uh, during the campaign, he gets shot. He's giving a speech in Wisconsin. Guy pulls out a pistol and shoots him. Uh, he's saved because he's wearing a uh, jacket, and he has an eyeglass case and a speech. And the bullet has to pierce this sort of uh, metal glass case and the speech, and it slows the bullet down. But it hits him, and you know, hits him. He's bleeding. He has a white shirt. You can see the blood sort of getting more on the white shirt. And uh, what would you do if you were shot making a speech? Would you say, oh, take me to the hospital, please? Not Teddy Roosevelt. He delivered an 84 minute speech as he was bleeding from the bullet wound. And he said, ladies and gentlemen, I don't know if you know it, but I've been shot, but it takes more than a bullet to kill a bull moose. And so the party, which was the progressive party was changed to the bull moose party. And uh, it was, a, <laughs> I mean, Teddy Roosevelt was just really a courageous, fascinating guy. Any event, uh, there was the election. Um, so the three, the three were running. Uh, as I say, Taft knew he had no chance of winning. He stopped making campaign appearances. But uh, Roosevelt and Wilson campaigned hard. And I mentioned the shot. But in the end, Woodrow Wilson won the electoral vote by a landslide. He carried 40 states. And when a large majority, 435 out of 531 of the electoral vote, basically taking advantage of the split in the Republican Party. He was the first Democrat to win a presidential election since 1892 and would be just one of two Democratic presidents to serve between the American Civil War and the onset of the First World War. So, you know, the Democrats didn't do well in politics back then because, you know, the South lost the Civil War and people were voting for the um, Republicans. Anyway, Roosevelt won 88 electoral votes as a third party candidate and the Republican candidate won eight electoral votes. You know, we think of third party candidates as not doing well as sort of, you know, one, two, two percent, they're just sort of there. I mean, Roosevelt was the major contender. Taft was almost like the third party candidate. Uh, and this was the third, first election with a former president running for a third term. And he really wanted that third term, but he didn't get it. And in the popular vote, Taft lost the popular vote. He only got 23%, Roosevelt got 27%. By the way, you know, FDR uh, ran for four terms and won all those four terms. And afterwards they passed a uh, amendment that you can't do that, it's only two, two terms. Uh, but basically, uh, uh, well, I won't go into why FDR did it, it's not part of my, uh, my talk. Okay, but the election of 1912 is fascinating. Teddy Roosevelt, you should read about Teddy Roosevelt. There is an interesting guy, a self-made guy, weak as a kid, did exercise, built himself up, uh, had all kinds of wonderful adventures with South America, Panama Canal, uh, just drank, I think, I read this somewhere, a gallon of coffee a day, totally wired, um, and just uh, a real power. Okay, so let's see what the election, that's, see, 1912, the country's now looking more like we know it. And by the way, at this point, you know, uh, black, blacks can vote, but in 1912, women can't vote, right? So women don't get the vote till 1920. And part of the reason women get the vote is World War I. You know, the men go away, women take jobs, and women say, come on, it's about time we got the vote. And uh, they got the vote. There's Roosevelt and Taft. They were good friends. They didn't talk to each other for a few years. Then one day Roosevelt ran into Taft in a dining room and they got back together and they became friends again. So you never know. You argue with people, you have fallings out, but sometimes you get back together. There's Woodrow Wilson, uh, who always thought he was right. Uh, as I say, he's moving down in the, uh, but he, he's done, he's sort of famous for foreign policy, uh, foreign policy association, um, as Wilson's one of the heroes. Wilsonian democracy in World War I, he was known for trying to bring democracy everywhere. Uh, but but in, he, World War I really killed him, literally. Uh, he tried to get the League of Nations passed. That was like the United Nations. And uh, certainly, um, certainly uh, that would have been an interesting idea, but, Wil but Wilson was such a tough to deal with. He should have he should have had the Republicans help him do this, and he should have had the Republicans come over with him to Europe to do the peace in World War I, but he didn't do that. And he eventually campaigned across the country against the Republicans and for the League, and he had a stroke. And uh, 
Actually, he came back to the White House. He was in his, in his room for six months. His wife would go back and forth and say, this is what my husband said. So you could argue she was the first president because no one knew what he was saying. Uh, but in any event, uh, here's Wilson. Now, the last election I'll talk about is the election of 1948. That's, wow, really cool election, interesting. So there you have Truman, who's the incumbent. You know, Truman was FDR's, four, you know, during the fourth term, he was vice president. FDR had different vice presidents in his terms. Truman was the one for the fourth term. FDR dies in the fourth term, Truman takes over. Uh, FDR never told Truman anything. Truman becomes president and the generals and the uh, military say, by the way, uh, Mr. President, we have an atom bomb you can use. He never knew about it. Uh, he made a lot of good decisions you know, to end the war, but he was kind of unpopular in the 1948 election. In 1946, in the midterms, both houses of Congress, which were Democrat, went to the Republicans. So you can see the mood in the country is changing now for the Republicans. And opinion polls during the uh, 1948 election show Truman, uh, only one in three Americans approved of Truman's handling of the presidency. He wasn't a very popular president, uh, even though you know he won the war, but I think many people felt mm -hmm. he, he wasn't strong enough and the Russians took over lots of uh, communist countries, well, became communist, and he wasn't strong there. And, uh, he just really was pretty unpopular going into the election. And so all the polls, this was another one like uh, 2016, all the polls had his Republican opponent, Thomas Dewey, who you could see on the right as the winner. Plus, not only is Truman unpopular, he's got a couple of candidates from his own party running against him. He's got Strom Thurmond from the South, who's running as a Dixiecrat, because uh, he wants the, the South to maintain the segregation. So there's a third party uh, Dixiecrat ticket. And then you got a progressive who was a Democrat too, Henry Wallace. So Truman's running against two folks in his own party and, the, and a Republican, uh, New York Governor Thomas Dewey. So Dewey's the New York governor. A lot of candidates for president come from New York governorships. So, uh, and, so and so everyone thinks, I mean, they are really everyone thinks Truman's gonna lose. They think Truman's going to lose so much that the Republicans tell Dewey, you don't have to do anything. Just don't make any mistakes. Don't go out there and say something stupid. So he just, speech after the speech, basically Dewey says nothing. One famous line is, he says, you know that your future is still ahead of you. I mean, you know, stupid lines like that, which mean nothing. But he's really not trying to prove anything. He's just trying not to make mistakes. He's not killing himself campaigning because he figures this is an easy election to win. But Truman decides he's going to give it his all. So he begins a coast to coast train campaign in which he covers 22,000 miles and gives up to 16 speeches a day. And that campaign is known as the whistle. And the speeches are termed whistle stop talks. So he goes into a town, talks in the back of a train, they go on and on. Anyway, uh, he's trailing in the polls, and uh, in one of the election, in one of the campaign stops, a Washington supporter yells out, "Give him hell, Harry!" And Truman replies, "I don't give them hell. I just tell the truth about them, and they think it's hell." So, "Give him hell, Harry!" became a lifelong slogan for uh, Truman supporters. Uh, anyway, Truman ridiculed Dewey by name. He criticized Dewey for all kinds of things. He said the GOP stood for gluttons of privilege and said the Republicans were princes of privilege and bloodsuckers and, with offices on Wall Street. So he's running against the Republicans. The Republicans have begun to nail the American consumer to the wall with spikes of greed. So he's really going after uh, Dewey and Republicans. And uh, all the polls showed that uh, Dewey was going to win, just like what happened with Hillary. So uh, they have the election. And it's 4 a.m. that the Secret Service agents wake Truman and say, you won. Now, uh, the Chicago Daily Tribune had referred to Truman as a nincompoop on its editorial page in the run-up to the election. And poetically, a printer strike forced the newspaper to publish its morning edition hours earlier than usual. And the headline of that paper, which came out really before they knew who won the election, was Dewey Defeats Truman but it was really the other way around. Truman 
garnered 303 electoral votes to Dewey's 189. Truman won 49.6% of the popular vote to Dewey's 45.1. Okay, and so as I say, it was a big election. There's the uh, electoral map. There's that famous headline, Dewey defeats Truman. And Truman obviously has the last laugh. And there's my email in case you want to work, tell me how great I am. And if you don't, don't use it. But I also do other talks, so uh, you can may do that. Okay, so let's go to uh, get rid of that and I'll take questions or comments. Great, thank you so much, Martin. Let me end the recording here before we start questions. Hold on one second. Thank you. Sure.